Okay, um, welcome everyone um, today to our talk, push button deployments with Red Hat Management. This is uh, the third edition um, of the talk which we're giving. Um, my name is Laurent Dorn, I'm a principal cloud solutions architect. I work in the New York area with the most uh, 10 strategic accounts uh, which we have at Red Hat. And I'm covering the entire cloud portfolio, so that means um, Cloud from Satellite 6 and Civil Tower, as well as OpenStack, OpenShift, and Red Hat Virtualization. Okay, and uh, my name is Maxim Burgraad. I work as a c senior solutions architect for the Red Hat in the Benelux region, and I cover mainly our large financial services accounts. Okay. You got a clicker? Yeah. So we've done this now two times. This is the third go around for the push button deployments. Is there anybody in the audience who was here last year as well? Do you remember what we didn't do well last time? <laughs> we didn't actually show the demo. <laughs> we didn't get around to showing you the demo. So we're starting to do the demo first today. We're going to show a lot of stuff. And contrary to what we showed you in video afterwards about a year ago, we're not going to just do RHEL and OpenStack and stick to Red Hat portfolio. We're going to do this very broadly. We're going to include other technologies. We're going to include middleware. We're going to include Windows. We're going to include databases network equipment, so we're going to do a pretty extensive story here. And because we called it push-button deployments, we thought we'd actually do a push-button thingy. Is the next one? Oh, yeah, we have the next one. So if you, who, who's ever built some automation in cloud forms? Okay, there's only very few people. Do you remember how that was? All the easy Ruby? Yeah? So you don't have to do Ruby anymore. Cloudforms is now completely um, controllable and works completely with this other technology that we've acquired a couple of years ago that is infinitely easier that is Ansible. So during the demo that we're going to show you, uh, we have written an exact amount of zero lines of Ruby. Everything we're going to show you is native Ansible running from Cloudforms. You could theoretically run it from um, Ansible Tower as well, I guess, but Cloudforms has a couple of um, advantages that we'll talk about later. But everything is native, Ansible. Everything we do is um, Ansible talking to um, clouds and Ansible talking to uh, servers and Ansible talking to CloudForms back. No Ruby. So that's interesting to know. Um, that brings me to uh, actual button pushing. You want to have that one? Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're going to start with a demo. Um, I'm just going to flip here afterwards to, to one of the pages. So I can just go to the request here and make sure we're still in there. So we wanted to do something special. Um, and what that means is this. So when we think about button push, we really want to push a button. And so that's really what I think we should do today. So um, I think someone should push that button, right? Start off so today. we have uh, this piece, which is the red button, and uh, you want to push. Sure. So you need to make sure that you read this one, two, three, you flip the key, and then you press. So just uh, hold on a second, hold this, and I'm going to flick back to the CloudForms UI. Um, so we're going to see the request page here in the CloudForms UI, and as you can see, there is a job which is finished. So if you can start uh, flipping the first one, the second one, you got to flip the key, it's going to turn red, and click the button. Okay. So what we should see now in a few seconds, um, if I click a refresh, um, we should see a new request which uh, comes in, and we see here it actually started a new install. So we just kicked off a new install um, with a push of the button um, with a nice little tool here. Um, the detonator. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so let me, let me talk to you guys what we actually started here. So as we do it every year, um, we really try to incorporate all the management pieces which we have, but this year we really wanted to go a step further. 
So we have Red Hat Cloud Forms, which is known to be a little bit complicated from a Ruby perspective, but as I said, there is zero Ruby in what you're going to see today. It's all Ansible, pure Ansible, so if you know Ansible, you can run this demo. So the first step of that demo is we're building a Windows host with Ansible in AWS. Once that Windows host is built in AWS, we're kicking off three rel hosts. And those rel hosts are automatically going to register to Red Hat Satellite via CloudNet or user data. Once that's done, um, we're having a request which goes back to CloudForms. And why do we need this? We need that so that all those VMs which just got created got passed on back to the service. So when you're actually looking at your service later on, you're going to see that there are four VMs created and you know exactly which ones are which. Then because we wanted it to be a little bit more challenging, we have an FI flow balancer in AWS. Um, this is just like the standard license, which allows you to have like one whip, one pool, and maximum of three nodes. So the three nodes which we have here, the three rel nodes, they're going to be JBoss at the end, and we're going to see that. We're going to create automatically a whip. We're going to create a pool, and we're going to add the three nodes which were just created to that actual pool. So then we're building MariaDB on Windows, um, again, all through Ansible. And the blue lines which you see, and I'm going to explain them later on in the demo, they're called dynamic resource objects. So when you're building an application, right, and you have infrastructure, it would be nice to have a relationship between the application and the infrastructure. So you know, I build a MariaDB. I build a JBoss instance. Um, which you see here, and the JBoss instance is connected to an F5 flow balancer, and we're going to see that in a few seconds. So all these dynamic resource objects are written to CloudForms, and then the next step is that we have Ansible Tower reaching out to Insights because it's aware of those clients which we just built, and then Insights is going to give back the playbook, which basically can remediate um, automatically for the vulnerabilities which these hosts have, which we just built. So we're going to show that. So let me um, just show you here what we have. We also um, pre-created another um, environment so that we have data to show. So this is... Um, the, the CloudForms portal, but before I log in here, I just want to show um, one thing here. So we have um, the environment where um, we were pre-built here, um, which, uh, which already has the low balancers and the, the VIP and the pool enabled. Let me make sure it's the right one. Okay. So this one we built like a few weeks back. And so what we're going to get is basically this on the new appliance, um, which we see here, which um, is currently empty. And um, you see here it's another appliance. You see it um, on, the, on the IP address. And if I click on network maps, like the, the network map says no results, right? So we didn't add anything. Um, so the install which we started is going to add that. What we're also going to see here is that I have four hosts currently in satellite. We're going to see we're going to get three more because three of them are JBoss, and they're going to get automatically added here as well. So the nice piece about um, like um, CloudForms being able to do that via Ansible is the, the following. Just, uh, Log in here. So this is the, the self-service UI. We now see we have two services. Um, this one is actually the one which we uh, just created. Um, because we have the data, we're going to flip back to the other one as well. I'm um, going to go to the one which you have here. So as you can see, all the VMs I've built with Ansible, they are visible here. Um, and just uh, to, to show you some examples, so uh, this is uh, one of the JBoss hosts. Um, and as you can see, you see right away, this is the Linux host. But um, important to notice as well, um, so we are in uh, AWS. And as you can see here, it says smart state analysis, right? So um, for those who don't know what smart state analysis is, it's a type of introspection. So we were able to introspect images in Microsoft Azure 
um, in the public cloud already a few years back, so one and a half years back. We can do that now in AWS too. So if you have an instance running, we can tell you what's actually running on the instance, and you could also run, for example, a compliance check to see if whatever you have there in AWS is compliant or not. Now, the nice piece about that is, is that, as I said, we have like this MariaDB um, instance on, on Windows. We can do the same thing um, you know, for the Windows host as well, and I'm going to show you that later on also in the main admin UI. So to give you an idea of why um, the, the resource objects are so interesting is because what you want to see is when you deploy something is that from a service perspective, you actually see what you have. So I know I deployed four VMs. I have an F5 load balancer, I have a MariaDB, and I have three JBoss hosts which deploy the Ticket Monster application. Now, not only, only that, um, you, you also have the, the possibility here of looking at the actual content. So I know this is my, my uh, VIP, I have the, the different nodes um, which we have available here. Uh, the same thing for the MariaDB. I, I can choose the connection string and for, for the JBoss host, it shows me basically what hosts are there. Now, this really, and um, I'm going to show you that now in the admin UI, gives me the possibility to go into the admin UI and actually see how the relationships work between those objects. Remember, too, that everything I show you is Ansible. The zero Ruby in there, okay? No state machines, like the entire deployment workflow, which we have here, is Ansible. So dynamic resource objects in, in CloudForms 4.6 are found here, OK? So when you go to a dynamic resource object, and this is what I, I mean, I've been waiting for this for quite a long time, um, because it allows you to do the following. So when you, when you look at, um, at that screen, right, you see that I have here different attributes defined. And you have VM associations as well, and you could also attach a method to it. But what that means is everything which CloudForms doesn't know, you can add, right? You don't need to wait for us to basically go ahead and, and uh, build it for you. You can just add it. And it's a table with key value pairs. And once you have that, you can feed it with data. And you see it. And so in this case, you see that I have an instance, like in that specific um, generic object class. And so I can click on that, and it points me to that actual object. And once I click to, into that object, it's actually um, then going to show me the VMs which are attached to that F5 low balancer, which are the three JBoss instance, and it shows me the actual VMs which are behind that low balancer. And you can do the same thing for the database. You can do the same thing for the, the app service itself. So it's very, very flexible from that perspective. Um, another, another piece just uh, to, to show you there as well, because I talked about smart state analysis, is that when we, when we look at that specific instance, and for example, on Windows, um, just to, to show you that piece there as well, is you see now here, on the left that we have the different packages which we have actually installed. So when I click on that, you have all the Windows packages or, or software which is installed there as well. And um, we also see the MariaDB, um, which we're installing here too. You can do the same thing, of course, on the, on the Linux um, side as well. Um, something which uh, I, I haven't showed you, so if uh, we go into provisioning, um, we also get, of course, the Ansible standard out um, of the entire Ansible workflow. So you see that um, in the, this is the admin UI. So in the admin UI, it doesn't auto-refresh. If you're in the self-service UI, it's actually going to auto-refresh to the entire workflow when this is running. So um, these are really the pieces uh, which I wanted to highlight. So I'm going to uh, hand over to Maxim, which can show you, like, once those instances are up, 
um, from a satellite perspective on how it's going to look like. So probably um, if, I, if I refresh that page, um, we're already going to see some more notes coming up, I would assume, uh, which we do. There we go. So right. um, you can go from there. So um, we also wanted to show a little bit um, about Red Hat Insights, because that is um, part of, uh, of, of solid modern application deployment. Um, we don't actually have to do a lot to use Insights. Is there anybody in the audience who's already using it or has looked at it? A couple, okay, that's, a, that's good news. So if you haven't looked at Insights yet, you really should. The only thing you need to do if you're a satellite user is basically uh, in your host group configuration. I'm not an Apple person, so I hope this all works. But so in your host group configuration, the only thing you need to do is add a single puppet class. So each system that we spun up um, uses the bootstrap.py script that comes with satellite to register itself to our satellite server. The satellite server, by the way, runs in AWS itself as well. And to give a little bit of, of the same feeling that an actual production application, actual production deployment would have, a lot of my customers at least, we use a little bit of Puppet to do the initial, bit, the, the initial deployment. So we use Puppet to configure NTP, we use Puppet to deploy Java because we're deploying a, a, an application on JBoss. And the only thing we did further uh, on top of that is add the Access Insights Client Puppet class. So the Access Insights Client Puppet class is going to deploy a single RPM on your system and set up a simple cron job for that um, binary that was deployed to run every day. And that is gonna grab a mini SOS report. So you, you guys know what an SOS, SOS report is, right? It's the thing you send to support if, they're, if they need a little bit more information about your systems. So there's a mini SOS report that is created by the Access Insights client, and it's shipped off to the satellite. The satellite proxies that to the Red Hat customer portal, and the, the satellite server will give me um, an overview of the findings we can then have about the systems we have registered with uh, Insights. For example, how does that scroll? For example, we have a very new system that registered two minutes ago. Now we can see that um, KDUMP is not has not been configured for this system. Um, we have a vulnerability in the Bluetooth stack for the kernel. And I think there was a third, there was a third one. Yeah, there is a, um, a security problem in the way the logging for this system was configured. Now, a couple of these problems we can actually fix automatically by using an Ansible playbook, and that is what we're going to show next. Because the Insights um, UI gen can generate a playbook for you. You can import that playbook into Ansible Tower, and then you can automatically fix problems on the systems you have running on whatever platform um, by just executing that playbook. How do I switch over? Not an Apple person. Uh, Red Hat, it doesn't make sense. When we log into Tower, we have a couple of inventories here that is places where we synchronize in um, systems information. For example, we synchronize in all of the information we have of our systems in running on AWS. I'm going to use that for now. And as part of this inventory, I can see all of the hosts that are running on AWS that I can um, control from Ansible Tower. As you can see, we have quite a few already. I'm going to pick one that is, um, if we've done this correctly, hasn't been configured yet with Insights. That's that one over there. So what I can do is can I, take, I can take that IP address. I can create a job template that I can point to a specific playbook that we've imported from the Insights portal, and I can fix the problems we found for these systems automatically. And the, the problems I showed you before in the satellite UI, you can show, you can find those problems in the tower UI as well. We're going to limit this to that specific IP. I'm going to call this job template summit demo. Swipe the right credentials for this. <coughs> Save it. And from this point on, we can go to um, our list of job templates below, and we can just execute this one. And Tower will now take us to the output page, and there we can see that Tower is going to log into this new system and fix any problems, insights found on that system, and make the system um, either perform better or more secure or more stable based on the information we've learned over our long history as a company providing support for open source. And that's what's happening here. 
Did I copy that wrong? Oh, you're wrong with two over the I one. Oh, I did. Okay, I picked the wrong <coughs> yeah. one. Okay, okay. Let's go back here. Yeah, go to the two for order. Yeah, the two over them. So let's take this one then. Uh, hold on, dot, dot 240. Dot 240? Yeah. I'm picking the wrong one? This is, this is the one with 240. I think this is the only one. No, there's no other Close, one. Out. There's no other one. Yeah, okay. Just want to make sure we're not doing this wrong. It's on the demo too. I could obviously reuse the, f the earlier one. But that is even probably an even better idea. If I would have swag, I would have given you some, but I don't have any. <laughs> Sorry about that. So we can, um, let's try this again. Yeah, you forgot. I forgot these. something, right? No, this one, yeah. obviously the table. Save that. I'm going to execute that again, and this should show um, some problems being solved on that specific system. Let's try that one more time. Oh, we can take a new one. I say yeah. no. It should work. And even if it doesn't, I think the concept is pretty clear at this point. Yeah. Pretty much all so we probably, probably did this one as well. Though. I know. Yeah. Let's yeah. Uh, move so on. Let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about this. Where is the slide deck? No, it's okay. Let me go back to, to this. So maybe maybe uh, to to just uh, show something here as well. Um, so when we look at the, at the specific hosts um, which we which we built here, uh, so we know uh, w one of them was was 186, um, which we have here. So uh, one of the JBoss servers. So if we if we go back to the actual inventories and we look at the inventory hosts. Um, which we have in AWS. And uh, let's see if that host shows up. So if we go to that specific host, um, the nice thing is here that I have the host and I can click on insights right here as well and I see hmm. what's actually wrong with this host too. Um, so we can check again um, here just one more time um, to see if this works or not, but it, sh it, should, it should work. Um, if we choose this and the playbook, and uh, it's going to put in the limit. Yes, we could do prompt or launch, just easier to uh, add it there automatically. And fix me summit is the one I have, so let's try this one more time. Okay. Yep. Okay, now it runs it. Great. Inside yep. generates a playbook, yes. What was that? Yes, yeah, because when you look at the insights piece, so when we go back to, to the beginning in the inventories, when you go to the inventory and you look at the actual host um, where, where we're matching, right? So the host itself, when you click on the host, for that specific host, you're going to get an insights inventory, right? So and from there, you can go and, and remediate. Okay, so let's go um, back to, to the demo. Um, so as we, uh, let me move on here. So we saw that already, um, and uh, we saw it runs. So let me just talk a little bit about the Ansible piece within, within the demo and um, how we were actually able to do this. So it's not much magic, but I think uh, some important pieces here. So the code um, can be found here on the, on the GitHub repo. I said it's all Ansible. So, um, I'm going to walk you through a little bit here as well. 
Um, very important, though, for the satellite demo itself. So to be able to run satellite in AWS, you need to be on the Cloud Access program. And for some smart state pieces, which we have, uh, you're, you're going to need uh, the, the um, Cloud Access as well, because it uses a atomic image, which is uh, only available with Cloud Access. So if you launch an Ansible inside job, and this is quite important because you're going to use that a lot when you begin to work with Ansible inside in Cloud Forms, is you get basically that fact back with the following values. Um, you have an API token, but most important really is the service ID, because everything you're building ties back to that service ID, right? And so when you, when you get that, like here is, for example, um, the new EC2 instances module, so that's Ansible 2.5. Um, probably for you guys who, you know, work 2.2, 3.4, um, you used the EC2 module. The EC2 module is quite old. Um, so the EC2 instances module is new in 2.5. There's um, a few differences there between EC2 and EC2 instances. Uh, one of them is this. So if you remember in the EC2 module, you have a count uh, variable where you can say, I want 10 hosts, going to build 10 hosts. EC2 instances does not have that. Um, so what you need to do is you need to have uh, a with items or an iterator to go to and build basically those images um, on the fly. Um, the challenge, though, with N is, is that you get a hashes of hashes back. Right? So it's not a list where you can just then go and say, I'm going to do with items, and I'm going to iterate through the list, which is kind of challenging. Um, but what you can do, and this is very nice, uh, I mean, Ansible 2.5, is you can make use now of um, the map functions, right? which basically then look for the attribute, which you have here. And if you have hashes of hashes which come back, there's a new function, too, which is called flatten, which basically gives you a flat list back of that hash which you then can use to iterate over those VMs which you just built. Um, another nice piece, too, um, here down here. So I have the Windows instances and the Linux instances, and I'm merging both lists together, which I then can use to add all the VMs to the actual service in Cloud Forms. So one piece, um, and you're going to find some documentation about it. Uh, the doc team is working on, on publishing those um, as well. So if you want to use dynamic resource objects, um, of course, this is all available via REST API, right? But I'm showing you here uh, how to do it and what you can do and how it works. So um, I really like that piece here so that I can pass a JSON. So in this case, what I'm building is the VIP, um, the pool, and three nodes. So this is really how I'm passing it on. So we see here the, the property types with the VIP, the, the VIP and the nodes. Um, the pool is, is fixed because I know what the, what the pool name is already from, from the beginning. Um, and then you have the associations, right? So remember, uh, when I showed you the first output from an Ansible inside job, I said the service ID is very important. And you're going to use that a lot, right? Because everything is tied to that service. So the association for that generic object definition, which I have here, is a service and the three VMs, which I have. So when you look at the service, it's going to say it's associated that generic object to a one service with three VMs. So essentially, once you have the definition, you're going to see that you populated the generic object definition, but now you need to tie the objects which you created to that service. And this is what this does. So we see that here. Um, this is actually also very nice. So this is in Cloud Form since uh, 4.5, um, which is custom attributes for a service. Like for those who automated a little bit uh, against Cloud Forms, you're aware that you can have custom attributes for VMs, but not for services. Um, so this is quite useful, because today, still in Cloud Forms, if you have a service and you want just a VM name back of that service, you need to loop through multiple HREFs to get back the service. It's very complicated. But if you do this with Ansible, and you can upload basically data to a custom attribute in the service, 
you can just say my, near, my, my VM names are XYZ, and you upload it as a service name, and when I show you retirement later on, which removes everything which we just built, all you do is you say, give me the custom attributes for that service, you take them and you put them in as VM names. So all the, the transformation from the hashes and go afterwards to the list, you don't need to do that. So it's very, it's, it's very useful. Um, so let me show you a little bit and talk to you about retirement here as well. So it's one thing um, to be able to build what we have and um, maybe just um, to check where the other service is. I'm just wondering how far we are. So this is the one which we deployed um, currently. It looks like it's still running. And just scroll down here. Or Ansible. Okay, it looks like it actually finished already. Um, okay, so what that means is uh, we can actually look at it and then uh, I can retire the other one. But we see here that's the one uh, which he pushed and deployed. So that's the new one, uh, live Red Hat Summit um, demo. We have the generic objects here as well. Um, you see the IP is the 219. If you remember, um, the 219 before was empty, right? So if we go to the 219 now and I log back in, We see now that um, that's populated here too, and uh, that's also the dynamic resource object uh, which we created for that specific VIP. So that's now what we, what we added automatically um, during the install, so that's there. Um, so what we can do too, and uh, we didn't show that uh, during the demo, um, that there is actually an application behind that. Um, so let me just uh, do that here. Sticket monster, right? Sticket monster, right? I don't think it's in four, eight four four three. Yeah. Yeah. This was an interesting learning experience. I'm not a Java guy, and uh, Ticket Monster by default talks to an H2 embedded database. So to make that talk to MariaDB on a different server was was interesting. Um, but it wasn't half as interesting as learning so much about Windows that we were able to deploy a Windows machine with Ansible and actually deploy packages on that because we're not Windows guys and that was, that was, um, that was new for us. But if you're, is, is anyone in the office that actually does both Windows and RHEL for a day job, Windows and other things? So the interesting part is Ansible has a couple of different modules to install software on Windows. And if, if, are you guys using Ansible on Windows at all? But there is um, a module that uses basic MSIs, there is a module called Win Package, and there's one called Win Chocolatey. That is actually the, the recommended one, and it works very well. It's like a package manager like Yum, but then for Windows. The only downside there is that makes you dependent on a third-party repository that might or might not be reachable. So that was basically our um, moment of truth here. Apparently, the, the, the uh, chocolatey repositories were reachable today because everything worked. Um, it, we, we lost a little bit of sleep over that over the past few weeks. Yeah, yeah so here you see that uh, application is the one which is behind the VIP um, for F5. Um, so, yeah, the, the demo worked from, from that perspective. So now, um, we have two applications here, um, and uh, really to kind of show you from a retirement perspective. So when you retire, right, and remember too, when we go into satellite um, and I go to the, to the host view now, and I look at all hosts here, we're going to see now that we have, you know, all the other three hosts which were just built there as well. So, you know, it's kind of a pain if you think about it, with satellites, sometimes you deploy a lot, but then people delete the instances, and that subscription stays in satellite, and you pay for something which you don't use. So what we wanted to make sure is this. So let me just um, click on, on that retirement. It takes about uh, 4 minutes, uh, 50 seconds here, but I'm going to retire that um, summit service here. And... Um, what this basically does is the following. So if I go back um, to, to um, retirement here, so the first step which I'm doing is I'm removing the, the VIP, the pool, and nodes from the F5 load balancer. Um, then once that happens, um, I'm going and removing uh, the instances itself, so the Windows instance and the, the rail instances. And then um, I'm deregistering satellite. Now, 
it's kind of an interesting thing here because if you say in satellite delete the host, it expects the host to be there. If you pre-delete it and it's a managed node, you cannot delete it from satellite. So the thing is that if you would make an API, you can just say delete the host before, before Ansible deletes it in cloud forms, then satellite would just delete it and remove the subscription. So I did it a little bit backwards here, um, which is I deleted it first, but then what you need to do is first disassociate the host from satellite and then you can delete it. Okay, so it's kind of a two-step um, which, we, which we see here. So let's just um, go back and see if we see now this retirement tab already um, popping up in the, in the services and maybe, um, let me see here, if we refresh this one might be that we see it already. If not, we can switch to the other one. The one maybe so the third in the fact that you have 35 minutes. Maybe you should show that it's empty later on. Because yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get there too. Um, so that's uh, some of the output. So you see here too, it says now the delete the generic objects. It goes and uh, uh, deletes the object here. And then um, the next step, uh, which basically is happening here, is I'm removing it, and this is live, that's why it reloads, huh? Um, it removes the VIPs like from that actual F5 low balancer. So this is the one which we just built. Um, this one is the one which we built earlier. So if I log in here, um, those, those F5 pieces should already be gone. So it should be empty, which is, so I deleted all the, the entries here. Um, it's uh, probably now, if I go back to Cloud Forms, um, still removes the VMs, so it takes a while. That's the longest piece, uh, yep, uh, which we see here. So uh, we have the four VMs, it iterates and shuts down the VMs. So I'm going to let uh, Maxim talk about how everything, um, or, or yeah, one, or maybe one piece first um, before, before we do that. So. I talked a little bit um, about the smart state analysis piece, right? And it's, it's, it's kind of very interesting on how that smart state piece works in AWS. Um, it took us quite a while to be able to build this uh, so that you actually can look into AWS instances, but it's interesting on how it works. Um, so when you, when you press that smart state analysis button in Cloud Forms, what happens in the background is um, it checks for an atomic instance, which is called the, the SSA agent um, in your AWS account. If that atomic host is not started, it starts up an atomic host. Then it throws a message on SQS in AWS and says, hey, I have a new host, um, I need you to go and scan it. Once that message gets picked up from SQS, it automatically does a, or generates a snapshot from the EBS volume and saves it into S3. Now, then what happens is, and you probably, if you ever used OpenShift and you use the scanning in OpenShift, you're gonna realize it's the same. So then the atomic host launches an uh, image scan container which maps that S3 snapshot, which we did from the actual instance, and then introspects that instance with the content which we collect from CloudForm, so the packages, the files, the processes. Once that's done, it unmounts that, deletes the snapshot, and sends the info to CloudForms. So now that you have that information, um, you can do the following. So you have a bunch of information that you're pulling from uh, your instances on, on um, AWS at that point. Um, that information includes what users are available, what packages are installed, what patches are installed on Windows, what uh, certain files you want to monitor perhaps. And you can use that information in cloud forms to um, mark a system as compliant or incompliant based on policies you can define by yourself. So for example, if you have a corporate policy that says you always want to have a certain version of an application running, or root access should always be disallowed, or the administrator in Windows should always be disabled, you can check for that in the smart state analysis data. If CloudForms finds that, for example, the root account is not disabled on RHEL, it can mark that system as incompliant. If it's disabled, it's obviously 
compliant and you're done at that point. If it's marked as incompliant, you can do a lot of things. Cloud Forms is, is pretty flexible in that area. Um, the simplest thing would be to send an email to the owner of the system. Cloud Forms can also um, know the concept of an owner. So you can send the o an owner an, uh, an email and, says y and tell them you need to fix uh, the fact that Root is able uh, to log in at this system. But you can do a lot more. You can, in, in the most extreme case, just turn it off. Turn off the system. Root is allowed to log in. We're going to turn it off. Um, alternatively, you could say um, we're going to move the system to a different cluster. Or, and that is probably the nicest one, you could actually fix some of those problems by triggering an Ansible playbook again and using Ansible to disable root login. So you can find those problems and fix them. A little bit like Insights does it, but then um, custom made for your own specific um, purposes. Um, I will do a quick recap before we have probably a couple minutes left before we can maybe answer some questions if there are any. Uh, we wanted to give you a broader overview than we did in the past years of what is possible with the Red Hat management portfolio. So managing systems on, in this case, a public cloud. Last year we did private cloud. And we want to extend that, very, we want to show very specifically that Ansible is your enabler there. And Ansible will allow you to automate deployments on clouds, um, and not just creating the instances, but also deploying the applications, creating users, um, connecting systems to each other, making the database system know that it should allow a connection from a certain JBoss server, telling the JBoss server that it needs to connect to a certain database. It's everything that can Ansible enable for you. Now, if you're a large organization, like a lot of my customers are, you probably want to extend that towards the networking area. Because it's not just my application and my server. It's a bunch of my servers, probably behind a load balancer. And I don't know if, if this sounds familiar to you, but I've, I've heard this a million times. Um, we can build a server fairly quickly in 2018. And then it takes us a month to get it hooked up to the load balancer. Does that sound familiar to anyone? So if you can extend the reach of Ansible in your organization to the networking team and to the networking specialists, you can actually create a workflow that includes hooking that server up to the load balancer and making that server that you can deploy inside of an hour hooked up to the load balancer inside that same hour. Because hooking it up to the load balancer, as we showed, that's a piece of cake. Now, we showed you an F5 running on AWS earlier. Um, we do a lot more inside of Ansible. We have a bunch of um, network vendors that we work with. Um, a lot of these companies are maintaining their own modules inside of Ansible. So it's not just Red Hat creating them. It's, it's actually our partners creating them together with us. And you can get support of these. So you can just call your sales rep and say, look, we're going to do this. We want to make sure this works all the time. If, if we need help, we want to get help. Uh, we have support for the networking modules inside the Ansible's queue as well, inside the Ansible setup's queues. Um, so we used a bunch of products in this demo. And I want to highlight them one by one real quick. Um, we used Ansible Tower here to um, basically, in, in our case, just show the integration with Insights. But if you have a large organization, you might have tens of thousands of servers. Ansible Tower is the place that can, that can help you scale out your configuration management and your automation. And um, it can run a job at a set interval. It can run it every day, every half hour, whatever you want. It allows you a fairly rudimentary but still very useful um, set of self-service capabilities. We didn't show that, but you can create self-service dialogues in uh, Ansible Tower as well. But if you want to have the concept of a service where you actually can connect the things you create with Ansible together and bundle them in, you know, in, in a service in, in cloud forms and have auditing on that service and um, compliance reports and have knowledge about the size of the instances everything is running on and um, performance metrics and chargeback, that is where, where cloud forms shines. That is what cloud forms brings to the table as an extra on top of just plain Ansible. We showed you Satellite for the basic configuration. A lot of my customers do that. Use Satellite for the basic configuration with Puppet and then deploy applications on top with Ansible. As you might know, we've talked about this before, I think at last summit already, Ansible is going to grow, uh, sorry, Satellite is going to grow Ansible capability as well in the future. So you could use Ansible instead of Satellite um, in the same fashion. Right now that is limited to Puppet unless you want to use the callback feature that is um, part of Tower where you can do an API call to Tower and have then um, make Tower then run uh, a job template on the server that made the API call. It's called the callback. There's a lot of documentation on that. If you want to know more, just give me a call afterwards. Um, and finally, we talked about Insights, which is hooked up into all of these products that we talked about before, uh, at least in um, Cloud Forms for visibility. It's hooked up into Satellite for visibility as well and for uh, the fact that we need to deploy a little agent that we use um, Satellite for. And it's hooked into Ansible Tower 
to pull in the playbooks we create on the customer portal and allow you to execute them on your systems to uh, in increase their performance and stability and security. So that brings let's me. Just, uh, let's go just back to the demo. We have some yeah, a little bit sure. time here. Um, so just to, to verify that we, we, that we de decommissioned um, everything. So I think this should be done. It is. Um, so you see here too, like, um, as I said, it disassociates the hosts and then it removes them. Um, so when we go back now to uh, the hosts, um, you're going to see that if I refresh that page, they're gone. Right, so that means you freed up subscriptions. You can now use subscriptions again for something else. And again, we did this with Cloud Forms, but you can take those subs, right, or the, in the Ansible playbooks, basically, which we use for that play, and you can just put it in Tower or run it natively. So that's the beauty about, about it. Um, what, what we kind of showed you today here is that everything which we've done is really done with Ansible. Yeah, and you can do. Yeah, because, yeah, exactly, because the thing is that when you make an API call to, cloud, uh, to satellite and you say delete the host, it deletes the host if it's still there. The thing, though, is that I'm deleting the hosts in cloud forms first because I have them in a retirement state machine um, on the retirement, so I tag them with retirement, so it gets deleted, and then satellite says, hey, those hosts are not there anymore, but I'm managing them, so I can't delete them. Yeah. So I have to de-associate first to before I can delete in satellite. To be honest, if you would use these playbooks, and you would leave out one step, the connection between the instance running on AWS and the managed operating system in satellite wouldn't even exist. That is something you need to explicitly set. And we did that because we want to have that management capability. But you don't have to. You don't need to create a managed host. It's just yeah. if you want to be able to remove the host from AWS from satellite, it needs to be managed by satellite. Yeah. Does that make sense? OK. Okay. Yeah, so basically this is, um, we want to show you a little bit more than last year. I hope we succeeded at that. I hope this was entertaining at least. And um, you can get the code from GitHub. And we would really be curious if you grab that code and you alter it and you start doing your own cool automation with it, let us know what you're doing. Because you know, the possibilities are endless.